Winner bracket summer final. Final qualify everybody. Tomb of the Spider Queen is the map. We got the Bratwurst Boys against the Space Goofs. So it is the final qualifier for the Banshee Cup. And again, I promised you guys already in the first qualifier that we have a twist for the playoffs. Now this is not this doesn't apply today. But I'm going to reveal already, if you haven't heard it yet in uh, some of the other games, what that twist is going to be. So, the idea that we came up with to make things interesting, but also don't destroy the games, is the following. We introduce bounties to the game. So, each team can now complete bounties to get additional money. Each team has their own bounty board. So, if a team completes a bounty, it doesn't mean that it's completed for everyone and you can only complete a bounty in a single match. So for one match, you have one bounty. You can't complete multiple bounties in the same match. So you have to think a bit about what you want to do. The way that we're doing this is that, so we, bounties are, for example, win a game playing Murky, win a game playing Nova, win a, play, a game playing uh, the Butcher. The full list is going to be available once we're heading into the playoffs. We also have some uh, that are hinging on talents, albeit only a few. Win a game with Varian and pick Meme Blades. Uh, win a game with Abatha and pick Monstrosity. And then we have also some that are just more designed around like team compositions. Win a game with a triple uh, triple um, healer. Win a game with uh, an Overwatch team, for example. So teams can do that. And if they do win with a composition, if they lose, they get nothing. If they win with a composition or complete the bounty, they get $50. So that way, each team can decide, hey, do we think we can pull this off? Do we have a cool strategy of the rounds of uh, that, uh, that works with this? Or do we just like try to win the games and go for the actual prize money that is distributed between the top four teams? So it's optional. It's not mandatory. You can do it. You don't have to. And winning the tournament itself is still more important so it's gonna be pretty epic I, I really like this as an idea i hope you do too you can always give us more ideas of what good bounties would be in your opinion uh, can write that out this is the first time we're doing it i'm sure if we do it again we'll adjust a little bit and see what works what didn't work and we'll uh, adjust things accordingly. But for now, I think this is a pretty cool concept for the players. It's an optional thing. And it's also incentivizing some of the lower teams that might not be able to get into the top four to maybe come up with a cheese or two that would help them to fulfill some bounties and then do them. And again, bounties will be active in the playoffs. So starting the week after this. This is qualifier number six, and we are in the winner bracket semi. So all of the teams are still trying to get into the playoffs here. Tracer and Win together with Blaze. And on the left, we got Leoric and Junkrat for the Bratwurst boys to open things up with. Oh, a talking ban. Sylvanas has been hit again, and so have been some of the supports. Space Goofs have also been denied, not only Hogger, but also Tyrael here. Feels bad, man. If they wanna play Tracer, I guess Malfurion is still an option for them now as well. If ah sorry, Malfurion not really needed, they got Anduin. I don't think they were gonna get a double support with Tracer. That would be a little bit weird. And here comes Jojo and Brightwing. Very good AoE clear again. So yeah, you have the wave clear with Leo, with Jojo, with Junkrat. So looking good. And the uh, double pick to finalize game number one. Mm, are they gonna throw a front line here? I'm curious what the damage deal next to Tracer is gonna be for them you now. Are we gonna get a mage? Chromie and Murden! Alright, Murden's done, Blaze follow up, Anduin to save the day. Maybe also a bit of a root from him. Then you have Tracer and Chromie, Tracer just buzzing around trying to get people low. Or the other way around, Chromie poking and then Tracer engaging and getting the bomb connected and trying to solidify the kill. With Ultralisk coming in as our final pick for Tomb of the Spider Queen. And let's see. What is he gonna pick? My F is up. Just saying. And he goes Imperius. He's playing that a lot lately again. And I like it. Imperius as a side laner was always a lot fun. Okay. Tomb of the Spider Queen, map number one. Best of three series here at the Banshee Cup qualifier. Number six. Let's go.
Game number one, Bratwurst Boys against the Space Goofs, everybody. Over on the left, we got Death Knight on Brightwing, Ultralisk on Imperius, Hazops on Leoric, Dino on Junkrat, and Masquerade with Johanna. Over on the right side of the map, the Space Goofs with Play on Mirrodin. We got Epixos on Tracer, Dequaza on Blaze, X-Ray on Anduin. And Yasu, last but not least, rocking Chromie in the first game. So, let's see what we get with this. By now, we already have the Space Goofs, hoping, of course, to take down the favorite. But those boys have been dominating things so far in the qualifiers. Now, there's a couple of teams that were really doing well trying to keep them low. Team Ash, for example, got insanely close of taking them down in one of the finals, which was pretty impressive. Not only did they force the fifth map, but that looked actually very good for a long time. But of course, this team is just star-studded. They have so many top players here. It is kind of wild. And we'll see if there's going to be a team in qualifier number six that can take him down. First and foremost, well, <laughs> at least at the, at the beginning it doesn't look like it. Mirrodin, uh, he just pulled a Lauber, died before the one minute mark, so Mirrodin is already gone. And yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if that's going to affect things. I mean, for now it's definitely going to help them with the rotation, but it should be kind of wild. So yeah, either way, top side, there's already Masquerade just doing his thing. Again, he has the AOE, obviously, and uh, the problem is that he also is apparently very popular because everybody is now trying to go for him. Junkrat is taking the camp on the left side, and for some reason they just decided that they're going to leave him alone. They're like, yeah, you know what, we're not going to attack him anyways. Let's not do this. But Mirrodin gets attacked again as he's down there, gets slowed down by Hazu, and they're trying to get that kill, and they get it! The Dwarf died twice, huh? Budget Gimli, you know, sometimes you should just go for the OG version. That's what I'm saying here. Yeah, it's like, this is, if you go for the budget version every single time, you can't really complain when it doesn't fully deliver. And that's essentially what happened to them here. So a bit unlucky. The fight is already still centering around the rest of the team, and Muradin is going to be happy because he's not the only one that dies on uh, the side of the, the space goofs anymore. We have Tracer eliminated. They got level four, the Bratwurst boys, and they're doing their thing. The bathrobe is here too, by the way, today. Masquerade is here as well. So it's been a while, but we actually have him now too. So good for him. Now, bit of a setback in the early game. What can they do around it? Three kills to zero, opponent is a level ahead, you're getting pressure in the middle of the map, walls get opened up even without the objective. So uh, what's the next step? They've lost a few of their gems already. They actually lost a fair amount of their gems to be fair. They lost like 20. So that gets a, getting, it's a bit annoying. This could get snowballed. They need some kills and they need to also somehow try to interrupt them from turning everything in and getting the first web weaver wave. Because it's very likely that they're going to get it. Oh, Jesus, Muradin. He is getting farmed. Damn. They're playing Muradin whack a mole See Muradin, kill Muradin. Like every time he pops his head up, he's dead. Which is actually pretty impressive because he's not, he's not, not all that tall. And they're still able to kill him. So, uh, it's pretty hard to see when he pops his head up. You know, because he's a dwarf. Haha, uh -huh, no? Alright, maybe not. Anyways, level 7 is going to kick in. And from there, they should be able to get their turn into. Question is, like, I'm not quite sure if they really can do it. Like, level 7 is usually not a window that you can do too much on. If you're in Infernal Shrines, and it's a different story. But on uh, Tomb of the Spider Queen, not really. So, we'll see if they can pull something off here. Four kills to zero. We now have also level 7 kicking in. Yeah, play just barely jumping out. And Chromie goes down. That's five kills to zero now, guys. This is starting to hurt a little bit. They're getting slapped hard. So, there's the Web Weaver Wave. This could, this could be a speedrun. At this point, I'm worried that this is going to be speedrun style. And it's just kind of nuts how crazy these guys are. They are so damn good. I mean, again, the Bratwurst boys, they are the team to beat. They are the big favorite here now. 
And at the end of the day, obviously, it's going to be the playoffs that really matter the most. If you win in every single qualifier, that doesn't do anything for you if you're losing in the playoffs all of a sudden. So uh, some teams, I don't know if they're sandbagging here, but suffice it to say that this is a pretty spectacular run from the blue team. They're doing exceptionally well and it's just looking amazing. So as is, we're now having five kills to zero. The fort in the middle is very I mean, even if it doesn't fall, it's going to be so low. They're still attacking the bottom of the map too, hoping to get a kick here, a kick here, well, a kill here as well. And then kicking Muradin around a bit more. Fort is actually down. First objective and you take a fort. That is huge. And they're going to get a kill. And win gets away. What? Brightwing is down? Hä? We're living in opposite world. What's happening here? Ultralisk is there too. Uh, hello? Team? Que pasa? Four heroes eliminated. Uh, I'm not sure what just happened. It looked like Anduin would die. And then he was just safe. Gets like trapped by Chromie there. Then all of a sudden uh, Brightwing falls. Joanna falls. And that's four kills in a row. Uh, okay. That came a little bit out of nowhere, but fine. <laughs> um, that's a web weaver wave with an object, uh, not with an objective, with a camp at the same time. And now they're starting to make their move over to uh, the other side of the map in order to try and take a fort out to as a minimum. And they're having the earlier level 10 because they just got those kills. So that's a lot of experience that they locked in for themselves and heroic abilities will be countered by the blue team but still they closed the gap in experience that existed before and that in and of itself is already a bit of a win because they were far behind but yes here we go blessed shield is out again Murdin, there's the delivery system and can they get the kill play play is not having a good game you can't even blame it on him it's a tough front then to go up against a lot of cc and stuns and no matter what he does it seems like he's always becoming the prime target super quickly and they're just farming him hard play died four times we're only six seven minutes into the game and he died four times already it's kind of nuts brightwing gets hit with a fly swatter again and gets murdered so bye bye brightwing she's gone and the bottom forward is as well. And they're getting kills again. The space goofs, they've woken up. Good for them. I got a bit worried. No, I'm not gonna lie. I definitely was a little bit worried here, but apparently for nothing. I cursed it again, didn't I? Those caster curses are insanely reliable, by the way. I should make the teams pay me. I should absolutely let the teams pay me. I mean, at this point, it's so consistent. I was like, all right, look, look this is my PayPal. If I have a donation in a second from you guys, I'm gonna tell everybody how good your opponent is doing. That your opponent is absolutely crushing it, that there's no way they can lose this game anymore, and you all know what's gonna happen next. So, I should make this a business model. Damn. Great ideas over here. That's actually fantastic. So, yeah, good stuff. Either way, the camp on the left side is now also taken. We have 8 kills to 5, but again, at least the space goofs are fighting back. Now, when it comes to gems, they are roughly even. So that's another part where they started to get back into business. And yeah, we'll see. I mean, right now, Hazu turning in. They don't have the gems yet, but they're missing 5, so they're fairly close. This could definitely be a bad, rude awakening for the red team. Just getting back into the game and all of a sudden your opponent hits level 13 as a talent advantage. You're a bit hesitant fighting into them and they get crushed. Anduin knows now that he's on uh, defense time, that he has to just basically be the pocket healer of Murden or Murden is going to get wrecked. And he saved the day. I mean, good for Anduin. Hashtag useful. Finally. Yeah, they're trying to get a kill here too. Death Knight! Brightwing became the target very quickly and has started to deal with this as well. So always jumping out, trying to reposition, make sure that they can't completely murder the fruit fly. But the turn hasn't happened yet either. They now have the gems. They can maybe try and turn in at the bottom and that's what they do. Ultralisk with a turn in and there we go. That is once again a web wave. If they can now get a kill, I mean, if the red team gets a kill, yeah, they do. Da no, Dino got the heal! And he gets out! Tracer wanted it, murdered in trouble. Who gets the kill here? Rip! 
Tire and Mirrodin dies. Leo is there too. I mean, that's fine. That's a decent trade. Leo is going to be back so much faster. And now we have the chance to really do work and damage with those web weavers. If they can get another kill against, let's say, X-Ray here, even better. So they take him down and they're going to murder Tracer too. That's another 11 gems that they are going to lose. Always assuming that she is going to get destroyed. And yep, that's the case. The Quasar is deciding that he, d that he hates gems. He really doesn't like them. Gems are stupid. He would really have... He would prefer money or baguettes. And so he's most likely going to give his up as well. Yep, not looking good here for him either. What is it? Now they really want him. <laughs> they really want him. <laughs> They're coming in with the entire team. It's like, no, 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 no. You're going to die. Top side forward. This is the one that they're going to save. So yeah, they can keep this a bit longer down at the bottom of the map. This one has been destroyed. And since the web weavers are still on the ground, they can also push them in further. Hope to do, well, maybe even take an entire wall down, but if not, at least damage it. They also are super close now to level 16, and that talent advantage is, of course, big too. We're talking about walls being destroyed. The one in the middle has already been taken out, and the one down at the bottom of the map is about to get wrecked as well. So, yeah. Things are looking pretty solid over here. Dino gets attacked, gets out. The team is in full control again of the momentum here. In comes Leo. It's always it's always a thing. When you're having Leora going up against Blaze, then it's really tricky to get big value out of an Entomb. Obviously, the uh, the cooldowns don't line up perfectly, so it's essentially a bit of a win for Leoric if he can force it out. But you can always counter that with a good bunker. And Dequaza is one of the best side laners and the best Blaze players that we have. So he is not going to get shot by any of this. Once you have Buried alive, it's a little bit of a different story, but there's two heroes essentially on the red team side that are fantastic against Leos and Tombs. One is Blaze, as just described, and the other one is, of course, Anduin, who can just simply pull the target out, always assuming that he still has his, uh, his trade. And after level 16, it's going to be much, much easier for him too. So we'll see how much of an impact House Ops is going to have with the Auric after that. But level 20, again, can change things. Now, Siege Shines at the bottom of the map. All of the keeps have already taken damage. Again, Murden jumping out. Good for him. But always just like that one second where they feel threatened and just piling on that additional pressure. Yeah, nice. Great. Dino in real truck. Dino's dead. Nicely done. He fell for it. Face checked the bush. And Dequaza punished him for it. And now it's time for Masquerade to maybe die as well. Masquerade gets pulled back in, and he's dropped. Yeah, well done. There's the double, and it's a triple, baby. Imperius gets killed, too. So they're able to take Imperius down, and now it's boss time. All the way up at the top, so they can easily push this one onto the fort, try and take it out. But they also have to send somebody down to the bottom of the map, because, uh, guys, again... We're currently looking at Siege Giants that are going to go in for the keep. And, okay, Dequaza is going to take care of it. Dequaza is going to deal with it. So, good for him. Anduin is going to lock this in. And they are hoping to get a turn in with it. So, they're trying to go for the turn in at the same time. Now, we got 45,000 for Chromi. 38,000 for Junkrat. Mm, and there's a double whammy. Objective plus boss. That's kind of the dream. Object objective plus boss is kind of the dream in these situations. So that top four, you can already kiss that one goodbye. This one is not coming back. But in the middle, defense should be fine. You have a camp. It's also 18 versus 18 on the level count. So it's not like they're too far away from uh, the opponent. They're basically even in experience right now. But you can definitely make a bit of a play with this. And see where that gets you. Top four is now as expected gone. But they haven't really committed to a fight yet. So at this point, the Bratwurst boys are just sitting there saying like, all right, guys, let's take this slow. See what we can do. We have to defend our top keep. But they haven't committed to any of the battles yet. So they haven't really made a full stand there thus far. They will have to, but I'm not sure if they can hold that keep. Depends a bit on if they can take the boss down quickly. Web Weavers plus boss is just brutal. It's absolutely insane. Especially the later in the game you are, and the more those have scaled. Rip Tire, good hit, but the boss is still at a decent amount of HP. Can they take it in time? I don't think so. With a little bit of poking from uh, the Space Goofs, 
they, are sh they should be able to take that keep. And I guess no. They're not poking enough here. They didn't really target it too much. It's insanely low, though. It's kind of crazy that Chrome at no point just went in and said, like, all right, guys, let me handle this. I'm going to poke that out, and then we're going to deal with it. But they have the uh, Web Weavers at the bottom of the map attacking another keep, and now Chromie makes a play. Chromie made a play. That leaves us with one keep gone on the blue team side, and they are taking a surprisingly amount of damage down here too. So yes, matters are definitely a bit worse for the Bratwurst boys. The Space Goofs has essentially taken the lead in the series. Well, in this game. Structurally. They're actually pretty heavy lead in, uh, in structures. I mean, that's not even close. And they're getting another turn in. Damn, Space Goofs, baby. This game did not start off well for them. They lost play on Murden time and time again. He got absolutely murdered. But now they're really turning it, or at least they're trying to. Is this the moment when the Bratwurst boys bring it back? They go for Anduin, they take him down. Can they get more? Web Weavers again, they gotta be dealt with. And Hazu, that's 26 gems that he just lost, but they are picked up again. It's a four versus four though. Leo is always, it's just so powerful when you lose him in a fight. First of all, he draws the opponent's attention and then he can also slow them afterwards and will be back so much faster. But there's still an attack coming, and with Masquerade dying, this is more and more momentum in the hands of the blue team. They're doing better and better and better here. Another four destroyed, and the bottom keep should fall. Guys, Space Goofs are getting closer and closer to a victory in game number, in game number one. They're looking awesome. Web Weaver is on the core. Bot lane gets heavily targeted now. And I think the Bratwurst boys are going to lose this game. They need a team fight win. Maybe they can take down Tracer? No, they can't. They're losing Imperius instead. Bottom keep hasn't been taken. Core is losing hit points, actually. It's down to 87 now. And yeah, not enough gems for a turn in. That's the bad news for the Space Goofs. I mean, the Space Goofs are currently firmly in the driver's seat. They have the advantage. They're definitely running the show. But... Oh, actually, my bad. I thought they had 73 gems. They only have 23 gems. I was already wondering, like, who had them because I didn't see it. Okay. Uh, okay, they have 26 gems. So they can quickly get their turn in. I thought they had 73 gems. I misread that and I thought, okay, if they can get a double turn in, talking about blue team, then it's going to be a totally different story. But that's not going to be the case. Leo went into Burning Despair, so we're getting this a bit more often these days. We got Impervious too. So, one Web Weaver Wave is nice when you get it, but they definitely have to do more than that. You need some, some kills here. Are we getting them? 13 to 12. Damage output right now, we have 61,000 for Junkrat, 70,000 for Chromie. And the Space Goofs, they're playing them to the wall now. Space Goofs are crushing it. 25 kills in total in this game and they are going for another keep here they're also of course hoping to destroy some of the heroes specifically Hazops, to deny the gems to them we'll see if they can pull that off but for now the blue team is still holding more importantly they're holding the bot lane this is the one that they are going to be worried about the most because it has already taken damage and losing a second keep would definitely be a disaster for them i mean that would be a nightmare scenario given the situation that they're in right now. They're looking for a turn in. They have to. They have to try and turn in. I mean, get some kills too. Maybe now. Muradin. Yes. There's the kill. Muradin is gone. They trap Anduin. The heal house is still alive. The rip tire was not enough to drop X-Ray. Five versus four. Can they get follow-up kills? They want Tracer. And I think they're going to get her. Tracer. Swing to win. Swing to slow. Yes. It's enough. <laughs> Tracer is gone, that's two heroes down, and more importantly, boys, the boss is up. You have a chance to go for boss now. You have a turn in, and you have boss. That could change everything here. Leo dealt with the top lane control, made sure that the core is not going to be in any immediate danger, and with two heroes down, the boss is there. So there's not enough gems for the red team to get a uh, turn in. If so, they would go for the turn in play, where they just, like, you know, they turn in, boss gets taken, each team defends one and then you just like split so you basically sacrifice the gems that you have for boss defense 
but this is a big one for the Bratwurst boys. We're, level, we're 20 minutes in now, 19, 20 minutes in. So this is actually so much more powerful than what we saw previously from uh, the red team. Because now you have an objective that has already well scaled into the late game, and on top of that you have a boss that is going to hit hard too. So this is the problem is that the Web Beavers are spawning all the way over on the left side. It's the top lane that matters the most right now. This is where they can do the most damage. This is where they need to get at least a keep, but they're gonna be hoping to do more than that. Web Weaver's still on the way, but they wanna try and get some kills here and then make a play for the actual core. So, yeah. I mean, right now, there's the hit, X-Ray. Okay, gets attacked with the Entomb, but he makes it out. So, able to be alive, 15 to 12. A kill count. Oh, the pull. Anduin is just such a powerful hero in this. I shit on him all the time, but that's more lore connected than anything else. But the character in Heroes is just so insanely powerful. It is absolutely ridiculous. So, core on the attack. Keep in the middle. About to fall. Keep at the bottom of the map. Also in trouble. What can they actually defend? Well, the keep here is still standing, even with the catapult firing away. Keep at the bottom of the map. Oh, they get all of them? Can they save all of them? <laughs> yes, they can. I, I would be a bit annoyed if I'm on the side of the blue team. Really? Both keeps are this low? Damn. That's kind of nuts. 78,000 for our boy Junkrat in regards to damage. But the fight is breaking out over the camp. Muradin, he died six times. Is he gonna add number seven? Nope, misses the storm mode. And they are trapped in the entomb. And Blaze dies just before the bunker comes back up. Was not able to get the bunker in. And boy, that is bad news. Because now you have a camp. You have a five versus four. You can easily go for at least the middle keep, but possibly more. They have at the bottom Masquerade and Dino trying to take the keep out. Every single keep is going to get destroyed here. Wow. That is some sick plays from the Bratwurst boys. And again, they are in the driver's seat in the standings for a, seat, for a reason. They are the number one, and you can see here why. They were basically with a back to the wall and had more or less... I don't want to say no chance, but they had... They, they were really on the verge of losing game number one. And now, they're turning it. They're turning it on the opponent's team, and they are making it look semi-easy. <laughs> These guys are so damn strong, it's ridiculous. Blaze is back in 8 seconds. But I mean, even if you don't end it right away here, then of course it's just gonna get... Uh, the catapults are gonna eventually take it. Anduin goes down though. That's the healer eliminated. That's one of the biggest key pieces in those fights. They are going for the counter kill against Hazo, so at least, uh, at least Leo is down. But Muradin is dead too. Ultralisk is a bit low. Oh, nice. Jungle kill from Nequaza. Switching targets and hitting the jet propulsion like an absolute boss. Yeah, this guy is an absolute monster. Dequaza is crazy. But as I said before, with all of the keeps gone, it is still a rough spot, a very rough spot to be in for the team on the right side of the map. Then Dire Straits here. 57 gems now for the Bratwurst boys. This means that they are working on the next turn. And, and just can you imagine another, uh, another Web Weaver wave here? That would be just the final blow. That would be too much to handle. With catapults already pressing towards your core. Camps are now being taken on the map. I mean, map control is obviously fully in the hands of the blue team. 97,000 damage on Junkrat. So he is going to join the six-digit club soon. But take a look at Chromie. Chromie is at 130,000, basically. <laughs> Crazy stuff. Insane damage numbers from Chromie. Absolutely insane. Crushing it here completely, but they might not be able to win the game. So, yeah. That is bad news for sure. 18 to 14. Level, tw <laughs> level 24 by now. And they want the turn in. They're two gems away from having the magic number. Yeah, and they're getting them at the top now. All right, they're ready. They can get the turn in. Masco is about to turn in. They put everything on the single hero. That's game. It has to be game. If they defend, that would be insane. It would be absolute insane. Great blessed shield. 
At least he gets the bunker out, but Anduin is dead. Anduin is gone, so is Blaze. And yes, the Web Weavers haven't even touched the ground yet. So this is definitely game. Now it's definitely over. Before there was still this like outside chance, you know, that they can maybe win a team fight before anything else happens, take them on and somehow make a move, but yeah, it is just not happening this way anymore. If you're playing a 5 versus 3 at this point in time, there's just nothing that you can throw against your opponent any longer. Final damage numbers here, 134,000, 106,000, so Junkrat made it into the 6-digit club, and yeah. Good move by the Bratwurst boys, you gotta give it to them. They were on their last leg, but they were able to win it. Uh, Tracer? <laughs> Tracer makes it out. Spray gives him some point. Game's over though. 1-0 lead for the boys in blue. GG! Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Battlefield of Eternity! Game number two! Space Goofs against the Bratwurst Boys, everyone. And we're going to BOE. Now, as a reminder, you cannot play a hero more than once within a series. That, by the way, is for both teams. Like, lately, that question... Like, I think we've run so many Meta Madness now that people would know. But there's always, like... Which is good, I think. There's new people coming in and they, they always ask the same question if it applies to both teams. And yes, it does. So once a hero is played, he cannot be played again. The whole idea is that you don't see the same hero over and over and over again. So, uh, yeah. That's why we do that. But... As we're heading into map number two, let's see what uh, particularly the Space Goofs can do now. They honestly had a pretty nice first game. It was pretty close. And it was only at the end where the Bratwurst boys really turned it around and did their thing. So, yeah, we'll see. Hoga gets banned and the Quasa insta pixie rel. Again, the side lane are heavily prioritized by them. This is also the winner bracket semi-final. So whoever wins here moves on to the winner bracket final. And, you guessed it, the loser drops down into the loser's bracket. Shocking, I know. Uh, or as uh, an American tournament would say, the loser is escorted into the lower bracket because there's no losers here. There's only winners in our game. So they're in the lower bracket where they have another chance to make it to the next round. Uh, that was always my favorite with Blizzard. We always got lists. I told this before, but I think a lot of people have... It's, it's been a while. Especially at the beginning when the game came out, we got an entire list from Blizzard of what we were not supposed to say and what we should stay instead. You shouldn't say kill. It was a takedown. There's no maps here. It's battlegrounds. And shit like that. I think all the casters looked at it and we just immediately started laughing. I was just like, yeah, forget it. <laughs> this is not happening. <laughs> this is not happening. <laughs> Uh, it was always just like, oh, yeah, we need to be special. We need to have our own thing. Everybody else does maps. We do battlegrounds. Everybody else does kills. We do takedowns. Yeah, they had a whole, whole spiel with us. Because, you know, we need to... Uh... <laughs> oh, some companies, really. It's just like, they're getting too big, and then you have crap like that coming in. Just make a good game. Make a good game, make it fun, be passionate about it, update it regularly, and let the rest be done by other people. So, yeah. There's no loser's bracket, there's a lower bracket. There's no losers in our game. Oh. I mean, honestly, at some point, I would have not put it past them to come in and tell us, you know, like, we should call the loser the second winner. <laughs> uh, that, that didn't happen, by the way. But I could have totally seen that. Okay, Li Ming and Tehaka uh, are our picks on the left side. When you're talking Battlefield of Eternity, the main question is obviously always, what do you do to attack the Immortal? And we have Li Ming for the poke. There's still a few more options with like Vala. Yes, Sylvanas has been banned out. You could go Bambi. We have Genji already on uh, the other side, plus Tyrael. Stukov, Diablo. And Sergeant Hammer is up. Not saying that this is going to be played, but there is a chance. We've seen Hammer a few times. Also in Battlefield of Eternity. So, yeah. And well, there's the final double pick. I want to know what the second damage delay is. Genji's nice, Genji's great, but they need some. Ooh, carrot. Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. Okay, Abatha again. 
That is a pretty nice Abatha comp. I'm just not sure what it's going to do for them on Battlefield of Eternity. On any other map or so many other maps, I look at this and I was like, okay, give me more. On this one, I am not sure if that is going to be enough. It will be interesting, though. I can tell you that much. So, let's see. Let's have a look. Final pick for Dino. That's by going into BOE. Can the Broadwars boys make it a 2-0? And we got Kira! Alright. So, she could, uh, took the train from Wakanda, arrived in the Nexus, and now it's Kira time. I, I, I really, like, Kira is... Kira's win rate was always, like, so abysmal, and I think Ultralis kind of turned around a little bit. But they're swapping heroes. Is Ultralis not going to play her? I think they're going to put Ultralis on her eventually. Maybe Dino. Anyways, we'll see. Kira, usually her min win rate is a bit meh, but they've been doing okay with her, the Broadwars boys. Game number two, everyone. On the left in blue, Hazobs on Stukov, and as all of the swap shenanigans were done with, Dino is the one playing Kira now. Ultralisk with Liming going full mage on us. We have Death Knight on the Haka, and Masquerade is playing Diablo. So, uh, let's go. Right side of the map. Pretty, pretty aggressive combo. I mean, everybody here has mobility. Everybody works well with Abatha. We have X-Ray on Karazim. We have Evixos on Genji. Dequaza is playing Urel. Play on Tyrell. And Yasu with Abatha. Going actually into a Toxic Nest build as we're starting all of this off. It should be interesting. It should honestly be fairly interesting how they are doing this right now because, again, this combo, I really like it. It's a super aggressive combo around Abatha. Everybody is mobile. You can chase the team down. So once you build up some momentum in these fights, it can really drive your point home. Is it the comp for Battlefield of Eternity? I mean, we'll see. For team fights, it's still great. But if you're only interested in uh, the objective, it's a bit of a different story. Now... The fact that Abatha goes into a toxic nest build also tells you a few things because they are going to try and just slow down any kind of rotational plays that we are seeing from uh, the blue team. So Broadwars boys, they are attempting to at least abuse the early game a little bit before Abatha hits level 10. So they're going to try and come in, take some of these walls out and of course also heavily focus the first objective. And they can build up a lot of momentum here, that's definitely true. Spray game again on point, more or less. And uh, Hazu on uh, Stukov, which is kind of wild. I mean, he swapped heroes around a bit. You still have Masquerade as your main tank, but seeing Hazu on uh, on support is still a bit weird here. But then again, it is what it is. So Abathar already working with the shield a little bit. We have the camp down at the bottom of the map that they're now attempting to go for. Dino is already helping out here, whereas top side it's the red team that has started to get a few heroes in place so they can trade camps with their opponents. So each team gets one. And now it's just a question of what exactly can they do with them. And they're already getting the pressure applied right down here. Starting to make a bit of a move for that. Play jumping out again. It's insane how mobile they are. And look at this. Ultralisk is getting chased. The problem is they're still losing Karazim. They did a great job. If you would go against any other player and not Ultralisk like that, you might get that kill. But he is definitely a pretty slippery bastard. And there was just no way for them to get the kill. Moved easily out of that. They turned it, killed Karazim. And that was also first blood in the game. So nicely done by the Bratwurst boys. The Hark at the top, still up against Abathar, who is all alone there. That's going to hurt them a little bit. And Dequaza, nice. Ultralisk again low, but they just don't die. Maybe now. Yeah, Dino's not going to get out of this. Kira gets crushed. All that agility that they have here, all of those gap closers and escape tools really came through. But we have level 4 kicking in. That gives us also the prolific dispersal now. So the ration is in. Cooldown, reduction, additional charges. All in all, fairly useful talent if you're just trying to plaster the entire map with mines. And of course, there's also a chance that you're going to set up some uh, pretty sneaky traps against your opponent. That's definitely another one that they could try and do here. Like this one, for example. And Dequaza is sitting there. That's going to try and bait them in. Not that easily, though. So, yeah, Dequaza moves out, and they eat all the mines, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, they didn't do nearly enough damage to really be a threat here. It was annoying, don't get me wrong. 
and they dropped a bit low, but it's not threatening their life or anything. So, one kill against one. We have the Immortal a bit low for the red team. They've taken some damage there. For them, it's a bit of a problem, as I said before. X-Ray and Evixos are currently the two that are trying to take it out. But the halftime show is easily going over to the Bratwurst boys. They've also done damage down at the bottom fort, so they are starting to get a bit ahead here. And it's still a fight in which the red team only has four hit point bars in the map. And that's a problem. That's the downside when you're playing Abatha. That early game can be problematic. They lose Tyrael, who just explodes on this. More damage being done as they're getting zoned away. But, well, as the zoning happens, Immortal is still getting attacked, and they're walking away with a 50% shield easy. Yeah, Liming is going to take it. And then we'll see what they're doing, because topside, they could split on the map. They could try to get the Immortal at the top and go down to the bottom of the map here and start taking that fort out, so that's one of the options. Also, Dino... Again, think about how many mines there were, and he's at 50% HP. It just doesn't feel like it's a big deal, does it now? It honestly doesn't feel like it's a huge deal or anything. So, yeah, bit strange here, but okay. So, the attack is in, one down, but at least Hazops gets killed too. So, from the perspective of the red team, that's at least something. They get the kill, they're able to pull that off. They don't have a support anymore. And if your opponent doesn't have a support as they are pushing... Oh, Jesus. Yeah, that, that thing can't hit. If that hits properly, then uh, they are losing too much. So, a really nice engage from Ultralisk again. He's obviously looking for the resets. Down at the bottom of the map, the 1v1 continues. And Abyssa has decided to mule this up since the top side will fall. So, there's no saving this anymore. And, yeah, good, good choice. I mean, it's the only thing that they really can do here. Three kills to two, one level advantage, which is of course pretty big. Just trying to get a bit more here. Yeah, another big team fight between the teams. Dequaza, careful. On Urel gets licked and is gonna die. But Dino is dead too. So both or two of the side laners are gone. I guess the Haka is still there, but yeah, let's call for now. Kira also a bit of a side laner. She's more bruiser than anything, but still. Tyrael, he also dies. It's five kills to three now overall. And I suppose they're now moving down to the bottom. Ooh, excellent. Okay. Yep, there it is. The kill. Hazu gone. That changes things slightly. I was just about to say, they should move down to the bottom of the map and get that fort. But, oh, Death Knight. Look at that. Master taunt and spray. All right. Somebody is pretty pleased with himself. Mule is back out. I would have expected them to push in with another minion wave and try to take this bad boy out, but nope. That fort is still going to continue to stand a bit longer. But yep, next attack is coming. And they're pushing into the middle again. Let's go. What can they do here? Can they chase Tyrael down? They have level 10. They got their heroics. Kira with the relentless, unrelenting strikes. And we're getting the apocalypse. And Urel dies. It's starting to become a bit snowbally in favor of the Bratwurst boys. Now they can take out Mule, and then after that, of course, the next step would be to ensure that you are getting that bottom four destroyed before Abatha has a chance to do anything about it. They're going for Genji, which means that there's just nobody that can possibly help to defend this properly. So the bottom fort is gone. Top fort has already fallen. Death Knight is still super confident, just going for the camp at the top too. As you can see here, even Karazim showing up with a bit of symbiote support from Abatha didn't really change that for him. So yeah, they are looking pretty good here. This is the second one. And of course, yeah, there's no level 10 yet, which is the bad news. Halftime show is over. Karazim has at least taken some of the hit points off. But there's level 10. So now with heroic abilities, different story. Now we can actually start talking a bit about this. Seven-sided strike. Urel has her bubble. Not, not her bubble. Her thingy, her Arden defender. We have X-Strike in. Yeah, but the Immortal is not looking too spicy. Here comes the seven-sided strike. That definitely didn't do enough damage to really threaten uh, Diablo. Ultralis! Oh, Yasu! The copy is gone. Yep, Yasu loses the Abathur copy super early. Top side is still pushing. It's the camp, by the way, pushing too. The space goofs are in a real weird spot. But, yeah. There we go. Whee! Kira having some fun. Just swinging around here. Kira likes to swing. Eight kills to four. Unrelenting strikes. Is that a kill? Yes! Karazim is gone. I think the Immortal is going to fall in a moment. And that's going to be a big one. 
gonna be a real big one. If they can get more kills, even better. And Kira indeed gets the damage out. And, and, and. Ah! He's alive. <laughs> he nearly got killed there. Oh boy, that would have been funny. Good for Genji. Nine hit points, I believe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah more than zero is all that you need. <laughs> damage output. 24,000 for Liming, 26,000 for Abathar on the other side. Here comes the next little Apocalypse! Hazu and he's dead. Yeah, but poor Stukov. This is the third time that Hazu gets killed. Not really a main support and he gets targeted hard. Now Karazim falls, Kira falls, it's a bloodbath down here, damn. Genji is looking for kills but that also means that they can't deal with the Immortal. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's getting a bit rough. I'm struggling here. The hits keep coming. Oh, my bro. Yeah, now, that, now that we have her down, the hits really keep coming, don't they? They lose Urel, they use, lose Genji. Sanctification is there, but it's just a bit too late. At least Abathor was able to take Li Ming out, so good news for him. But it seems like the bottom keep is not going to make it. We're only 10 minutes into the game, so death timers are still fairly low, which is the only thing that might save the day for them right now. Especially since the Haka just got killed by Abathor. Good copy, but it's all about the keep now. They are trying, and the keep is still there. I would have YOLO'd. That's, again, Mule. Mule exists. Ah, uh, that hurts. I think sacrificing one more hero here would have been okay. If it would have helped them to take it. So, yeah. I think they could have done a bit more with this. It's always this weird thing because you don't want to get snowballed too hard. You don't want to end up in a situation where your opponent, of course, gets an upper hand. So you don't want to lose too many heroes. But still, now that Dino falls... Yeah, Dino's dead. Apocalypse was already used, so they're still forcing some of these fights here. They didn't have a talent advantage any longer. Godlang gets attacked. Nice wall stunt. Here is running out of mana quickly, by the way. He has nothing. He has nothing left. Oh, Karazim! Yeah, bye-bye. Ultralisk is having fun here. Ultralisk is getting big hits, resets. I mean, he is going for the damage now. He's trying another angle, and Dequaza, what a boss move by him. Soaks up all the damage, jumps into it to make it happen, and saves the day. Now can they push through? Karazim is the only one that's currently gone, Immortal is coming up. They know that Mule is there, but again, if they can go for a keep, I'm not sure they can take it anymore. Especially since the Immortal is now spawning too, you really have to think about what your priorities here are. Now, if the Immortal gets taken, I think they can do a lot with it. But the fight is there. Sanctification, all right. Five versus five once again. Seven-sided strike. Diablo just shrugs it off. The rest of the team moved in, at least a few of them. Totally fine for them. Dequaza, insanely low. And finally, Liming falls again. Abathar, they are able to take Liming out. So good for them. Oh my god, Kira with the long distance here. Whee! Another swing, and trying to go for the swing to win, but not able to pull that off. Can they at least take the keep down? I think they um, still might not be able to. Yeah, does not need to get away from this. Tunnels, and gets out with negative hit. No, he's killed! He actually still died! No! And Masquerade is dead too. Now at least he's gonna be coming back. Is this going to change the flow of the game? All of a sudden, the red team is about to hit the same level as their opponents. I mean, it's 15 versus 15, but they're going to get 16 around at the same time. So here we go. Right now, there's a chance for them to actually get into the driver's seat. So let's see if they can do that off. I honestly don't even know if Abathar killed with mines, if the Haka just tunneled in somewhere where there were a couple of mines on the ground or not. Or if he was able to just hit him there towards the end. But I think he must have tunneled into mines, right? Either way, Abatha is now at 44,000 hero damage together with Genji. Mines on the ground again, but oh my god, Ultralisk! Ultralisk again! With his big Liming plays here. Gets the reset, gets the kill, goes for play. And play gets bullied by Diablo at the end and killed as well. But yeah, Ultralisk as usual. Just bonkers. Comes in, bam! Takes Urel down and then just bunny hops through them. 
takes down Genji. 17 kills to 12. The moment it looked like the Space Goofs might have a chance to get back into the game, the Proud Wars boys come in. They're like, nope! And immediately they're taking it. So off we go. That's the move straight up for the Immortal. Top side is getting pressured. 16 is on the board. I mean, they got even talents, but they're going to lose the halftime show 100%. They can't win that one anymore. So, let's see. Is that it? Death Knight? Hello? No, not quite. Not quite. So, here's the chance. Halftime show is over. Abathur's defending. One keep gone. Catapults pushing. 17 to 12 on the kill count. Diablo not stacked yet. He needs to be careful. Masquerade can't die right now. And the red team is throwing the Hail Mary here. They got to. Seven sided. And DA Pork. Nice. Well played by Masquerade up at the front. But the sanctification is ready from Tyrael. And Masquerade is trying to get out. Still alive, but finally gets killed. And they couldn't get the counter kill. Space Goofs are throwing everything they have against the other team and finally some of it sticks. So now we have another trap with the Toxic Nests here. Can they win? They are winning the Immortal, aren't they? Well, I'm not so sure. It's getting close. Red team is going full defense again. Trying to go for the team fight instead, but they gotta be careful of Li Ming. If Li Ming gets resets, then it is all over for them. But that Immortal is dropping low, real low. So does Dino, and Dino is gone. Dino died to a severe lack of hit points. Ha <laughs> ha Can they get Ultralisk a little bit closer to the Immortal to just finish it off? They're gonna try. Ultralisk? Okay, oh yes, they get it. Okay, they at least they win the Immortal. Death Knight is basically playing Minesweaver right now, and he finds all of them. So, yeah. Uh, Urel, ult, stunt, Ultralisk! Oh, he just missed some of the damage. And then the heal came in. Can go for Death Knight. Play gets attacked again. It's just ridiculous. Honestly, like, this fight is just bonkers. The entire fight, from start to finish, like, it really, how long has this battle now been going on? We're 16 minutes into the game. Immortal at the top is going to break through the wall. We have catapults, by the way, basically on the core. Get finished by the Quasar, but it just shows once again how threatening this can be. And they kill Tyrael. So Tyrael is gone, at least. And up at the top, they are moving in to try and make a play now, but the defense is actually holding on pretty... Uh, it's a pretty solid defense. Wall is open, yes, the keep takes some damage, but honestly, who cares? If you can't take the keep out, Abathur's just gonna do his thing and mule it up. So, as long as Tyrael is dead, maybe they can move in with the next minion wave and finish the job. But they gotta do something. And they're trying. Poke with Li Ming. Have everybody in here. It's 10 seconds until Tyrael is back, though. It's not a lot of time to work with. It's really not a big window that you have there. And Mule is already working. Yeah, Abathur, he needs to get paid overtime. He's working his butt off. Fighting in fights, repairing stuff. Yasu loses the copy, even zoning the opponent out. 66,000 damage now for Genji. 56 for Abathur. Yeah, and Li Ming. 70,000. Easy. Easy top damage. So, on top of that, we have now, of course, with Mirror Ball, and oh, Karazim is dead again. They always go for the bald guys first. Karazim died, and honestly, I think that's insanely baldest. We need to create a bit more awareness for that. So, yeah, they, they just go for the bald guy immediately, and it's baldism. It's baldism in his darkest form. It's not okay. I really don't like it. We need to, we need to raise awareness, guys. I could, I, I should really create like a non-profit or something and get rich. Ah, uh, solve the problem, I mean. So, 20 is on the board. And yeah, this is I think where it's falling apart. They're gonna lose the top keep now too. Great fight. Yes, Kira has been killed, but with Karazim and Tyrell both eliminated. And they're going for the objective instead. So, uh, off we go. We got Controlled Chaos, Hellgate. Repulsion. Yeah, I'm repulsed already. And we got the silent killer. If that is not a farting joke, I don't know what is. I mean, seriously. When somebody tells you about a silent killer, what is the first thing that you're thinking about? Be honest. Be honest here. So yeah, I don't know how Kira prepares for that talent. If she just eats a lot of beans. 
but that is ruthless. Big team fight, everybody clumps up in the same spot, and then all of a sudden, Kira... So it's, yeah, brutal. And everybody just dies. I mean, it's massive amount of damage. Yurel is already dead. Look how Kira is all of a sudden popping off, and you know why. You absolutely know why. Yeah, it, it beans, I'm telling you, it's beans. So, two down already. They're going for the triple. Ultralisk! He's still alive! They want him so bad! But they get another kill. They take the Amazon copy out. That top side keep is in trouble. Yeah, it's really in trouble here. This one, uh, if, the, if the catapult just keeps firing away, it's going to fall. But now as they're moving down at the bottom of the map for Tyrael, they're of course going to try and take the game right here, right now. Not even wasting their time with the objective any longer. Just make it happen. And it's looking good. They go for Genji again. He gets slapped around and that's a kill. Nicely done. Liming, Ultralisk, once again, top damage dealer in a game. A 2-0 victory for the Bratwurst boys as they move on to the winner bracket final of qualifier number six. The final qualifier for the Banshee Cup. GG, well played. And yep, another great performance by the Bratwurst boys and Space Goops. They drop down into the losers bracket. Thank you everybody for watching the video today. I hope that you enjoyed the show and the commentary. And keep in mind that the spoiler protection that is going to run for the rest of the video is made possible by all the support on Patreon.com. So guys, if you want to support my work, if you want to help me start new projects and keep the spoiler protection in place, please consider heading over to Patreon.com slash Kaldor. There's also a link in the YouTube description and check that out. Thanks in advance and see you guys next time with more esports coverage here on Color TV. Have a great day.